We have a full schedule today of uh, lightning talks here, so that's good. We've got lots of different content, so I'm going to jump right in. The first talk is Matt, and he's going to be talking about starting up Sakai in a flash talk. Thanks, so, Sean. Here's Matt. So uh, Matt Jones, on XP, got to go fast. Uh, Sakai is perceived as hard to install. It doesn't use a built-in database anymore. Properties you got to set up. You have to find and download Tomcat. There's this farm floor out there that makes Sakai installation process super easy that a lot of people wanted back in the farm days. So new applications arrived to make Sakai easier to install. I'm going to get Sakai actually building now because it takes about six minutes to build it. And we'll go back to the presentation. And we'll talk more about what this is doing once it, uh, it starts rolling there. I'll make sure it starts up. So th this is uh, the, the presentation is going to be how you can uh, just build, start, run Sakai all in Docker. It's building now. So this will build real fast, and uh, we'll get back to that. So new applications arrived that make Sakai and other applications easier to build. Uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. I'm on a Windows machine here. Gives Windows a real show. Uh, Docker allows you to build and develop containers. You don't have to have anything installed. All I have installed on this computer is Docker. I don't have Java, I don't have Tomcat, I don't have My MySQL, um, GitHub. You can share and collaborate really easily. And uh, all the cloud services are all, you can just deploy stuff to it. So if you went to um, the talk earlier that David Hutchins did, I'm going to be kind of working with him on how you can kind of uh, productionize this as well. So this is the script. It's in Sakai Contrib, Sakai Docker Builder. So it's over here in uh, github.com slash Sakai Contrib slash Sakai Docker Builder. All there is really is a shell script. And there's um, some sample files for just getting it building, some instructions. All you got to do is really have uh, Docker installed. So you can go read through some of that. It's pretty simple. You just basically clone this repository, clone Sakai, and you can get like this building. So it's already at 291 out of 400, so it's about halfway done with the build. I'll just uh, get back to the presentation and then uh, present. And then um, there's some Windows issues. Uh, the disk I.O. is really slow right now on the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, there's an issue there for on GitHub. Um, the uh, Windows Home doesn't have Hyper-V support to run Docker uh, natively, so it has to use the Docker toolkit, which isn't quite as good. I have a virtual box installed on this machine uh, running Linux. Uh, in the future, very soon, WSL2 is supposed to come out. And um, it's supposed, they say that's 50 times better I.O. I'm super looking forward to that and trying it out. Uh, the build, I, I was running the build natively for a while. It took almost 20 minutes to build because of the disk I.O. issue. So uh, that is not worth doing. OSX and Linux, I've tried OSX. It works great. It works great on Linux. Installed in VirtualBox and Windows. So there really are no issues running these scripts. So you follow the readme. First time will be a little bit slower because uh, it has to download all the you know, artifacts from Maven depending on your network speed. I have everything uh, downloaded and cached already. The script actually uh, caches everything in your local file system so you don't have to download it again every time you do the containers. So in the future, we're talking about, you know, uh, let's see how it's going. It's, uh, it's done. So it's 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Now we're going to bring up Tomcat it's in a separate container. These are all in the, uh, the commands here. Uh, we need MySQL running first. We'll bring up MySQL. And we'll bring up Tomcat. OK, so Tomcat's going to take about a minute to start up. We can look at the logs for that. Docker uh, PS, Docker logs, Sakai, Tomcat, uh, MySF. OK, and this is going to start up. So in the future, we're going to, uh, I'm going to merge the work, the UVA and David Hutchins uh, for Docker Swarm, so we can have a workflow for production and development. This is really for development. I didn't want, I wanted to have a really nice development when I started working on Sakai again. You can just get, kind of go into a directory, build stuff, and you know, it debug, you can debug in the container. It, there's really cool stuff. Um, I want to add some additional options to the shell script so you can pass parameters, so you can, you know, change stuff without modifying the shell script. And I want to add in some additional containers, like I saw in David's uh, presentation, where he had, like, you could do the PHP MyAdmin, you could do, like, the, the gray log, other stuff like that. Those are real cool. Um, you, we could use those stuff on Nightly. Those, uh, and we want to just keep speeding it up. So the advantage of doing Docker is you can kind of switch the images around, use things that are faster, lighter, 
uh, try out new things, like you can try out Tomcat 9, Tomcat 10, all you gotta do is change a value in the shell script, and you can, you know, try out new Maven versions, new everything, and we, uh, I deployed a ton of um, speed ups of the build just by playing with it and seeing what was slow with the process. So, thanks, and we will go over to the local host. This is a different flash talk. Local host 8080. And it's still not started up yet. It's still wanting to start up. So I think I have one minute. Come on. So, yeah, the Tomcat takes about two minutes. Most of the time, you don't have to even restart it when you're doing um, the development, when you're building. It does all that build in a, in a container and just deploys it to the local file system. And it, it, uh, t the Tomcat just uses its own container and it reads uh, the files from the file system. It has MySQL on the same network. I've already also, uh, everything should be DDL'd there. Am I out of time? Oh, it started. So there's Sakai started in this environment in the Flash Talk. So thanks. Thanks, Matt. You're over by 15 seconds. <laughs> but really good job. It was the switching between Google Slides. That's what it slowed it down, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next up, we have software defined classrooms. Andrew? Oh, Stuart's up. Okay. And maybe because of time, I'll um, I'll mention that uh, Tomash is up next. So you're on deck. Yeah, so hey, I'm Stuart Phillipson from the OpenCast community. Hopefully, this should only take three minutes. Uh, this, is, this is a difficult concept to kind of get across, and I don't think it really even has a name yet. But we're calling it software-defined classrooms. So um, there's a bunch of developers in the room, and you've already software-defined an educational experience that used to be built around like wood and hardware. So in the past, I think when I went to university, you had to get your exam results by going to physical pigeonholes and you pick up a bit of paper, but you've kind of automated that or you've driven it online and software defined it by creating things like Sakai, where now you get examination results, feedback from Turnitin, that kind of thing through a, a digital layer that's completely replaced this physical layer. Um, so we're experiencing something like this right now, which is a very didactic form of teaching, and this is a massive part of students' education, that you're going to sit in rooms like this that are defined by wires that have either been put into the walls or gaffer taped to the floor like they are now, and this is quite a rigid experience. It's limited to what's in the classroom, and uh, I can't change it very quickly like you can with software. You know, I could um, insert all kinds of things into a software layer that I can't put into a classroom at short notice. So currently the world kind of looks like this. You know, you've got PowerPoint, and you've got a bunch of these black boxes. There'll be some at the back of this room that manage the AV switching. There'll be a cable that takes the video from my laptop and then back to this display. And if you want to change things, like have a video conference, you probably have to put more boxes into this environment. And right now I'm guessing that very few of you do any sort of software development with this. And it's not that there's not software there. It's just locked in boxes, completely proprietary, with no APIs that you can interact with. So we think the world is changing, and uh, all these things are becoming basically internet-enabled. It's kind of like a, a cloud storm is building. But right now it's very uncoordinated, or it was until recently. So we noticed a change with a new piece of technology that we would call a software protocol called NDI, which boringly stands for Network Device Interface. And we think you can get a grab bag of things now, which include everything from the video from laptops to learning management systems, and start integrating them with kind of middleware. So we've built a functional prototype that does this using just JavaScript and some Python, a program called Voctomix. And you can start blurring the lines between physical classrooms and your digital spaces. And what's more is it goes a bit deeper. It starts actually replacing the physical devices that you'll be putting in your classrooms, like AV switches and so on. So in this brief talk, I can't go into a fantastic amount of detail, but if you have a look into NDI and you're interested in doing software development in this place, uh, please talk to me or please consider coming to the OpenCast 
summit, which is in Ghent in February. I think there's a, there's a big gap, basically, where uh, if you leave a, a vacuum, uh, uh, nature will abhor it. And if you leave a vacuum with software, proprietary manufacturers will fill it. And I think there's an opportunity here for open source developers to be involved with defining everything from the classroom teaching and learning experience all the way up to the LMS and everything in between as kind of one seamless experience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart. Next up, we have ITC 2019 by Tamash. And on deck, we have Martin. So hello, I'm Tomasz Müller, and I'm here to... <laughs> okay, it's there now. <laughs> to present the International Timetabling Competition 2009, which the UNI Time team is co-organizing. So this is not a, a first time ta course timetabling competition. There have been two in the past. And the aim is to essentially bridge the gap between the research and the practice, because there are a lot of timetabling algorithms out there, but it's, it's hard to compare them because there are no, no, no common ground. So one of the reasons for creating these competitions is to have some common ground. And it also generates a lot of ongoing research because you can compare stuff and, and such. There, yeah, there have been two competitions in the past, in 2002 and 2007. What I would like to point out is that most of these data, most of this competition has been based on computer generated data or on simplified real world instances. So in our competition for the ETC 2019, uh, we would like to use real, real world course timetabling problems. So we essentially used unit time to collect data from our users. So we have data from 11 institutions from six continents. There are the logos of those institutions over there. And we use that for, for, for the competition. So the competition is about creating an algorithm, a, a solver for, for a course timetabling problem. It's not exactly what we have in unit time. The problem has been simplified. The formulation has been simplified, but hopefully in a way that does not make the problem any easier to solve and it any easier to, or to, to to come up with this everything solution. So it's, it's about classes that you need to place in time and rooms, and also about students that need courses, and you have to place them to individual classes. And there are some objectives, op optimization objectives. There are preferences on times, on rooms, on, on additional distribution constraints between classes, like you can say these classes has to be back to back. And of course, we want to minimize the number of student conflicts. There are some additional aspects, like the room, you have to uh, consider distances between individual rooms so that the rooms may not be available, or some of the classes do not meet every week. They can meet uh, even weeks, odd weeks, or just half of the semester, stuff like that. So the competition was originally an announced at the PATAT conference in 2018 in August in Vienna, and the winners will be announced in uh, in 2020, uh, the next PATAT conference, which would be in, in uh, Bruges in Belgium. The final submission is November 18, so there is still time to actually compete. And you essentially will have three sets of the data, which is essentially about 10 instances in each. One has been already released. The middle set will be released about a month before the, dead, the final deadline, and the late instances is just 10 days, so that we make sure that that you just cannot use a lot of computers, a lot of resources, and have a not that good algorithm, and just make sure that about that. There will be some prizes. Uh, the, the sponsors are, are listed below. One of the prizes is $500 for the best open source software, which was uh, contributed by, by Apero Foundation. And my last slide is just a, a few highlights. So for the solvers, there is no time limit. We're only looking for the best solution for, for each instance. Commercial solvers are allowed, so you can use things like, uh, well, <laughs> like IOLOC and, and stuff. Any number of machines, any number of cores. 
we already have had two milestones. It's just mostly to be able to, for, for the other competitors to, to see what are kind of the ranges where, where the solutions are, are coming in. There is a solution validator and that's based on the unit time software. There's an API and it's available on the competition website. We plan to have the website maintained after the competition, which is quite of important because if the data are supposed to become some sort of a benchmark to compare algorithms, we need to have some tool that would be able available always to kind of keep track of the best known solution. So anyone who builds a new solver can compare that. And that, that has been a case for the past competitions too. The solvers would be ranked on a like Formula One ranking. So for each instance, we take what's the first compet first solver, the second solver, and we'll give give uh, points based on that. Though there is more points to be distributed for the later instances. At the moment, we have 143 registered researchers or team in the competition from 49 countries, which is uh, quite a lot. And yeah, there is still time to compete, and there is the www.etc2019.org website if you are interested in more details. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tomash. Uh, next we have Martin, and he's going to talk about the LAMP camp. And on deck, Matt, were you going to go? Uh, it's going to be Matt. Okay. One of the things that's cool about this is that you get lots of different stuff. Let's see if that'll work. That's a good sign. Come on now. There we go. Okay, so I want to talk about the lamp. Pedagogy and Technology Conference, which will be in Kentucky, July 23rd, 24th, 25th. Basically, this is a shameless plug. You're all invited. Um, before I get into that, just a quick little survey of what the LAMP Consortium is. First of all, and I always say this, people think have all kinds of ideas, but it's a community. It's a group of schools, 16 but right now. They're not all schools, actually. We have, for example, the National Dance Education Organization. If you teach dance in the US and you're certified, you took your certification through Sakai and did all your coursework through Sakai, um, through our instance. It's a single instance of Sakai that we share, and we also provide additional software like Big Blue Button, and there's lots of things we could talk about there. Um, we provide the hosting support, faculty development, because most of our member schools just don't have resources to do that sort of thing. And we've been live, I've been talking to people, we've been live longer than most folks. We started April 26, 2006, so we've been doing this for a long time. Um, but the, the, the conference is, is a really cool event. That's uh, last year's conference. People, we typically get people lined up. You probably know some of those people, particularly on the front row. There's Wilma, there's Josh, uh, Laura Geckler there on the left, or in the middle, sort of. Um, but basically, we call it the Pedagogy and Technology Conference because first and foremost, it's about pedagogy. It's not about technology. The technology then supports the pedagogy. That's really what we're, we're after is, is thinking about what students learn and then how do we help the, have the technology help facilitate that. And of course, we use Sakai a lot for that. We have tracks for people who are new to Sakai, so if you have faculty who have, are new to your institution or new to, newly thinking about using Sakai, it's a great way to get them sort of jump-started and up and running. But we have things for more advanced people too. Um, we, we have lots of conversations. We're going to have lots of conversations about rubrics this year. That's going to be a big topic, I know. Um, we also try to include administrators, things that administrators want to know and want to think about. And uh, it's very informal. That's part of the joy of it. Lot, all the meals are included, and you get to know people on a, a different, deeper kind of level than you would if you uh, were, were going to something. That we, it's informally called LAMP Camp for a reason, because it sort of feels like a, a camp-like atmosphere. This year, the theme is experiential learning, which is an interesting theme. It was proposed by one of our faculty at Brevard College. And so we're going to try to take that whole idea of experiential learning and apply it to how we use it in Sakai. I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, topic. There's some people you may know who are going to be speaking. Um, there's the, that dolphin guy is coming. I don't know. I think that's pretty great. 
Um, but uh, some of the folks across the bottom, we, we've got somebody coming from Turnitin. We've been using Verisite. They bought Verisite. We want to quiz them about how that's going to all work. Uh, Mim Pride ran, she was the president of a college that, where every student had to work, and there was an experience that was considered an experience. Kathy McConnell's from the College of Worcester, where they use applied mathematics during the summer for their students to actually use what they learn in the classroom. Um, there's a guy from Longsight, too. He's a nice guy. So um, th there's just a list of some of the topics. I mean, we've got lots and lots of topics that we're going to cover, um, but just to give you an, a rough idea of, of what it's all about. Uh, but the bottom line is, you'd be welcome. 350 bucks is not a whole bunch. That includes your meals. Lampschools.org slash conference is where you go to register, and we'd love to have you. How am I doing on time? Two minutes. Oh, then I get to put in a shameless plug. I wrote a book. I wrote a novel. I'm really proud of this. It's, it helps people understand technology. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin. That was great. Uh, next up, we have Matt, and he's going to be talking about my learning analytics and student data privacy at Michigan. And we have Yonan on uh, deck next. All right, so another presentation. Nobody signed up for this slot, so I figured I would uh, f fill this um, one, too. Um, so uh, during my D job, I work at the University of Michigan now, and I work on projects that um, give students a better idea of their information. I was at a number of sessions today and uh, yesterday where people are more interested in getting analytics, more interested in privacy, more interested in, you know, student what students have, what we have on students. Uh, the two keynotes were both about this too, and this is exactly what I'm working on. So it kind of like fit into this flash talk. So uh, at Michigan, uh, I am a, a developer on My Learning Analytics. It's a tool that uh, we've been writing. It's an, it was initially just a demo for Unison, UDP. It's this uh, essentially a uh, place where we have our data warehouse. It was all Django. Now it's React and the Django REST framework. Um, it was an IMS Learning uh, Impact Gold Medal winner for just a couple weeks ago, and it's open source. Um, all the code is all the code that we have um, is open source, except for one little piece that is about to be open source. We have collaborations going on with other universities: University of Iowa, University of British Columbia. Also mentioned before, there's probably more to come. Um, we're in a pilot. We've only been running it for two semesters so far, so. Um, there was a data depersonalizer we wrote that goes along with it that uses the, the Google Cloud um, you know, data privacy filter that you know, gets rid of all the, we can use you know, sample data. So there's, there's more information here, there's a slide. So I'll, I'll share these slides with, uh, on the Whova and um, with other people if you want to see that. So this is a, just a quick demo of this application. I have it installed with the, uh, the anonymous data. So there's in this application, there's three visualizations. There's uh, files accessed, assignments, and grades. We're working on uh, other visualizations. They're being prototyped. We're working with researchers, students. For, um, British Columbia already has a couple visualizations they're planning on adding. Uh, the grades kind of will give a student an idea of, their, of where they are in the class, where other people's grades are. Um, this is a really popular view. Assignment planning will show like all the assignments that are going on in the class. Currently, this is uh, based on Canvas, but you know it, it could use data from Sakai and other LMSs um, if that data was available. It's like we, we just have to provide the data. And there's also a files view, which currently isn't working. But um, in the help, you can see the, uh, the files view. It kind of looks like uh, it kind of looks like just some bar charts. It kind of shows you which files you've read, which files you haven't read. Just on my local host, it wasn't working because the data is incomplete, but it allows you to like, kind of say where you want to start and stop. And it, it might show you that a lot of people have read this file, but I haven't read this file. And we can click on the file and go read files that are available in your class. And a lot of people have been using those kind of tools, too. 
Um, we're going to add support for more things than files. We're going to add like so you can, if you're watching videos or if you're, it's all based on Caliper that files view. So uh, let's see. The next uh, project that we have been working on, we had interns last summer working on a project called My Data. It's a privacy tool for the UNM community. It allows students to view the data that we've collected on them. So it's still a work in progress. Um, but there was uh, work from four interns last summer. This is kind of their, their presentation on that. Um, go maybe full screen. So I just, it, there's a lot of data out there. And you know, you, as we saw, Canvas has a lot of data, Blackboard, Google. There's a lot of data. And university has a lot of data on you. So we, the students and we would like to give you know, users a dashboard, kind of like how Google does, where you can kind of see all your data. and, and make it you know available to students to, to know what we know about you so there's there's a lot of next steps to this and it's kind of a prototype but it's just something that people at Michigan are thinking about and for the last thing uh, we are work we're also working on student voice projects dialogue flow Alexa Siri so students can like ask questions and you know just get information back uh, on, on their own personal data and just on just general university data. So there may be more info, info next year on this. This is currently my summer project. And uh, we, we could possibly wire up some of these, you know, intents and ideas if we get uh, involved into to learning management questions uh, into Sakai. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for sharing. Uh, next up, we have Yona, and it's uh, curating quick faculty landing pages. Oh, and next on deck is Nathan. Cool. Hopefully my drafter works. Will it work? Oh, come on. Will it talk? And then I'm going to have to pull, pull the drafter. No? Okay, please. Oh, oh, thank God. Okay. Let's see if this works. How y'all doing? It's the end of the day, all right? Wow, there's a screen down there, too. Um, it's not pushing to the other one. Let's see if it goes to the other one. Here we go. Uh, will it do other screen? Uh, I've never done this on Linux before, so I'm going to say this works. Um, no, that's not that one. Can I switch screens here? Anyone know Linux really well? Uh, yeah, I know. Here we go. One second, here we go. Back to display. Yeah, I got it. It's uh, mirror displays. Here we go. Will it mirror for me? Please mirror. Okay, apply. Come on, there we go. Good. One, two, three. Changes, come on. There you go. That's good enough. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> awesome. Can I reset the timer? Yeah? OK, how y'all doing? My name is Yona Feinstein. I'm from Pepperdine University. Uh, not the one up in Malibu. I go to the one uh, in West LA, about 12 miles from here, which is about a seven hour drive. Um, welcome to Los Angeles. Um, I'm the lead client analyst, which means I uh, am the front person for the help desk. I interact with faculty and staff and students and administrators all the time. Um, and my job is to listen to their problems and help them fix the computers that are on fire. Um, it's pretty much what I do. Here we go. So I'm going to talk about creating, please, creating quick faculty landing pages. Um, so how can we assist faculty in creating more engaging landing pages? Um, we have this thing like this. Um, what happens is that uh, our registrar system pushes a basic kind of overview of what the course is and really not so engaging text into the courses pages when they're generated per term. My adapter is really old because I like to reuse old technology. Yay for recycling. Um, and it just, it's, it's not engaging. And it really happens to make the course not as enthusiastic as it could be. So we developed a simple procedure to help them, um, which is making a Google form. So it's five questions. Please, please connect. Please, please. Come on. I see it up here. Uh, five questions that pushes to a data set in a Google Sheet, which we then use a mail merge application, uh, which is can, it's got a free version as well as the paid version. We've got a paid license. Um, and then we push it to Sakai. So I'm going to show you how this works really, really quickly. Here we go. So I have this great form here. So here it's got 
five questions. We'll go this together. Um, I'm going to use the name of one of our factories. So we got uh, John, last name is Buckingham. Right, he's the name of one of our people here presenting as well. His father's also in faculty. Um, and his name is pretty generic, so it really helps the software. Um, I'm going to use my email address because I don't want to go into John Buckingham's email, email box. Um, his course is about, let's call it just finance, whatever. And uh, what, like to, what, would what do you like your students to know about you? Uh, I am Batman. And submit. And what happens now is it gets sent off to uh, Excel as a Google Sheets page, which the mail merge program picks up. It's going to go into my email box. Come on. This is what uh, mail I'm getting today. Here it is. Fa Dear Pepperdine faculty, please open the CK editor and courses and click the source button at the top and paste in the following code. There we go. So I'm going to go select this. Now, granted, this is all really quick put together code. I haven't polished this out yet. So we're going to get some errors. I'm going to copy this. Now I'm going to go over to my courses page. Remember this one, right? I'm going to go to edit, go into the source. Here we go. Give it a second. Come down. I'm going to paste in what the code is. I'm going to update the options. And there we have a quick landing page for my faculty member. Now, it's, I put in some fancy CSS because I want it to look nice for you guys. And uh, Courses hates it. But um, that's pretty much what happens. Uh, I pulled the picture down because uh, I used fancy, uh, I used some fancy trickery with how the name works. Um, if your faculty are like our faculty, they all have a first name and a last name. And your faculty pages are all, you know, faculty directory first name slash dot last name, uh, you know, dot HTM. Then you can easy, easily do the same. Uh, some nice color, which makes it appealing to faculty, to make makes appealing to students. And then uh, you can even even click over to the faculty page, and the students can see more about our faculty member. So this is a quick tool. I built this uh, in a very short amount of time. I can teach you the same thing. So if you want, you know, that's our quick faculty landing page. And if you got any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm right here all the time. I live in Los Angeles. I'm working here at Pepperdine. And uh, it's uh, pretty awesome. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Jonah. Um, sounded like a lot of people were interested there. So I'm sure they're coming to contact you afterwards. Uh, next up, we have the UVA portal in Sakai by Nathan. And um, that will take us pretty much to the end. But we might have time for one more, which Brian's already asked me for. So Brian's kind of temporarily on deck. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I just want to let you know to start off. I'm not going to be as funny as Yona. <laughs> or Brian. OK, so what I have to show off to you guys today are basically some mocks and sketch of an application we have just begun building at Virginia. Um, it's based on the Vue.js infrastructure that we have uh, started working in in order to deliver our search, uh, a new search tool that you may have seen in one of the uh, presentations the other day, or as well as Site Builder, which is our new way of creating sites in, in the Virginia instance of Sakai. Um, so all of this is enabled by the awesome architecture that um, David Hutchins has set up to to deploy different things in different Docker nodes. Um, and so what we have is um, basically Vue.js running inside of a node instance that runs inside of its own VM. And then it um, basically uh, runs on the same network with Sakai and therefore can very easily be kind of iframed in to Sakai. So this is kind of the next phase of, of that. Uh, we're trying to um, build a new portal. Um, and the portal is designed to solve some problems that we know Sakai users have today, um, and also introduce a little bit uh, different kinds of orientation than, than what they're used to. So um, this is kind of the existing calendar application inside of this uh, new portal. We think of this as like an evolution beyond what Sakai is today, not a revolution, but, but a next step. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that we've gotten rid of the sites menu altogether and replaced it with uh, a crumb trail uh, with a drop down menu here, uh, which will be where I'll show you we house our site links 
And that enables us to get rid of the My Sites menu altogether up here. Another thing you may notice that is that we have a search bar up here now, so that's quick and easy access. Oh, okay. So this is a search bar up here uh, next to our bullhorns. So this will enable easy access to search from uh, you know any place in the Sakai application whenever the user wants to search for something. Um, and, and we also have a new toolbar, which has some new meta functions I'll show you in just a sec. Okay, and this is also the mobile view over here on the left-hand side, um, which is hopefully a simplification over what we have in Sakai today. All right. Okay, so the new sites drop-down menu that I'm going to show you, uh, one thing we really want to do at Virginia is be data-driven and not just make decisions based on what we think is right, but what our users tell us is right. And actually, I was talking to Kyle from NYU just the other day, and he was saying, uh, yeah, he's saying they have data that shows that actually users don't like favorites at all, and so uh, that's, that's a great segue to this because I'm going to show you three versions of this menu. Uh, the first one has favorites because that's obviously something that Sakai supports today, but we may find out that once we have this new functionality, we don't need favorites or another approach to organizing this menu is better. Uh, but the basic idea is that the user would be able to uh, click into this drop-down menu and quickly get to the courses and collaborations that they're most likely to want to navigate to. And all the functionality you're used to seeing in my sites uh, would be here instead, uh, kind of at one, one click, rather than having to go to a totally separate uh, page in Sakai. Uh, so in addition to favorites, of course, we have uh, the organization of their courses by current and most recent and upcoming semesters on the right and collaborations alphabetically. And then for that, those professors that have hundreds of sites, uh, they can dive into the year-by-year -year organization down here. But maybe favorites isn't the right thing. Maybe we want to organize this instead by recency. Uh, we like this at Virginia because it doesn't require the user to do anything actively. It's just based on their behavior. So if they visited a site recently, then it would pop up in the most recent dropdown. But it may be that none of that's necessary. And actually, what we need uh, is just basic organization by semester here. Um, so we're going to test our way to find that out. But this basic idea is that all of these are sites would be accessible from this menu, and they don't have to navigate away from the main Sakai UI in order to get to it. Um, the other thing you'll probably have noticed at the top here is that we have this uh, crumb trail. And the idea there is that. Uh, we would also support deep linking in Sakai. So the idea that people can click a URL and not only go to a tool in a site, but a panel within a site uh, in a tool, and also potentially with data pre-populated, et cetera. So you would be able to navigate in the calendar um, down into week April 7th through 13, and you could give a student or an instructor a link directly to that point in the user interface. So supporting deep linking is a big part of this as well. All right, I'll just move that around. I'll do that. All right, so uh, in case you are interested in what this might look like when you're not on the home site, here's what it looks like when you're in a course, and then home kind of becomes just an icon on the left here, always providing easy access to the user's home site if they want to return to it. Here is a mobile view of what the profile menu might look like on a cell phone. Sorry. I'll wait. It's a, it is a lightning talk, so I've, I'm sorry, Al, but uh, <laughs> make sure you can actually at least see it. Um, and then what I really want to show you, though, is the new toolbar meta functions, which are over here. Okay. So uh, the idea is that our you know collapse button, which currently exists in, in Sakai at the bottom, though, so it kind of gets forgotten about a little bit. Uh, be brought up to the top where it's more likely to be used uh, by the user. And because we want to provide, obviously, we want to give as much space as possible to the content of the tool. And so in easily enabling the user to collapse those tools and have the most amount of real estate possible, humanly possible to see their tool is really something we wanted to accomplish. Um, but from this larger tool, the idea is that the user would also have this edit tools meta function. And instead of going into manage tools in our site overview, they'd be able to quickly bring up uh, a, a edit view of their toolbar and rename, drag, and or up and down to, to reorder. 
uh, remove or using this sort of gear icon do some of the similar functions today, lock, make invisible, et cetera. They'd be able to sort those tools alphabetically if they wanted to, add new tools, and of course, save and return to the initial view. And uh, that's it, I think. Thank you very much, Nathan. I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about with that uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, thanks. And last up, we have four minutes left for, for Brian. You're going to do it in three. There we go. Who knows what a mono repo is? No hands. One hands. That part. Two hands. Sick. Okay. That, that was all. That's all I wanted. Oh, so. All right. So we were rambling in the uh, Sakai Web Components conversation. So um, my team at Elms Learning Network has actually made, it's a little meta, but tooling that generates mono repos to work on web components. So it's to help large teams and large software projects actually collaborate. All a mono repo is is, hey, we all work at Ubuntu, and we have like 10,000 repositories. Let's publish them as 10,000 repositories, but actually all work in one large development workflow, right? So you can share issue queues as a basic example. Um, so you can learn more about WC Factory is the name of it at wcfactory.js.org. Or it's on, it's on Yarn and NPM. You can you know, do Yarn Global Ad at WC Factory slash CLI. That is not the point, though. The point is, you portal project has a mono repo. This is how they work on all the web components in their uh, development. So I can easily go into their repo, go to at you portal, and I can start to see the different elements they have. This is how Elms works. Elms works in like hacks and all the rest of that stuff is all managed under this folder. So we have a lot, just a couple. Um, and so this is a prototype. This is not you know saying this is what it is. But instead of having the Sakai elements live within the depths of Sakai, which ultimately, yes, they will have to get deployed there to work in the end. If they're abstracted and kept in their own repo, that can help keep the QA process specifically associated with the visual assets abstracted from the rest of the platform, but also allow people to publish and repurpose bits of the Sakai ecosystem external to Sakai. So now that doesn't make a ton of sense day one, right? I went into elements and I actually took the uh, Sakai rubric tool in this case. And what our tooling does is it doesn't say you must use lit element or HTML element or any type of a specific library. What it says is, if we're ever going to make sense of this, we need to have the same commands to run, right? So this is the same repo structure no matter what you go into. So I know, or everyone on the team then knows, hey, we're in the Sakai elements directory. I'm going to go to elements and then the Sakai rubric. And at any one of those elements slash whatever, I can run yarn start. And our tooling will automatically generate micro documentation about the element. So if you make your elements well, like these are actually made pretty well, Earl, um, then you'll see documentation built automatically. So I think this could revolutionize the QA process in Sakai, and it really helped us as well, just because you have your visual assets agnostic of data source. So you can really start to not argue, oh, the button looks weird when it shows up here. Like you can just focus and hone in on the button, get consensus around that one thing, accept that visual asset, and then you later do your QA process downstream, knowing that it's visually sound. So um, I posted this to the Slack channel for, for Aperio. Um, welcome to pick it apart. Um, so yeah, the, the process for people to make new things would then be the same. I do WCF element. And then it steps through and then the Sakai and I'd say I'm going to start using the, making this new Sakai element based on lit element in this case and be like Sakai hyphen dashboard and it's for funsies. And I don't want to use SAS or you could say I do want to use SAS and I, if you want custom properties on that, do you want it to be wired to hacks? <coughs> um, you could do that too. I could say hey there's a title, it's a string, default value is cool stuff. 
No, don't make it available to CSS. And then go, and the tooling is getting all the dependencies, roping everything together, because if you go down this front-end development route, you will quickly have several gigs worth of node modules. So if you don't want several gigs worth of node modules, use our tooling. Um, so this is not making an opinion and decision saying you must use lit. You notice in the right. CLI, I actually added whatever. Right. But thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I had to cut you off there. We're coming to time, but thank you for uh, filling that last little gap at the end. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Can we give a round of applause to everyone that presented?